Good evening. I'm Ruth Bergman, Director of Education at the Holocaust Memorial Center. I would like to welcome everyone to tonight's program. A special thank you to our museum members and donors who are watching. Your generosity allows us to provide virtual programming like tonight's talk. Thank you also to our community partners, the National Council of Jewish Women, Michigan, and the University of Detroit Mercy's Women's and Gender Studies program. March is Women's History Month. This month is set aside to honor the contributions and achievements of trailblazing women throughout history. Tonight's program features inspiring and encouraging women of all different backgrounds who chose to fight back against the Nazis and their collaborators. Through words, art, and Molotov cocktails, these women took an active role in the rescue and resistance movement, saving their lives and the lives of others. I would now like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Lori Weintraub. Dr. Weintraub is professor of history and founding director of the Wagner College Holocaust Center in New York. She received her BA from Princeton University and her MA and PhDs from the University of California, Los Angeles. She is co-author of the play, Rising Up, Young Holocaust Heroes, and co-curator of the permanent exhibit on rescue and resistance at the Wagner College Holocaust Center. Weintraub has received several awards for her interfaith social justice, and in 2019, she was named a Staten Island Woman of Achievement. It is my honor to welcome Dr. Lori Weintraub. Thank you so much, Ruth, and it is an honor to be here um, speaking with the Holocaust Memorial Center audience, and I want to thank Liz and Sarah for all their help in making this event possible. And I want to welcome um, everybody in the audience and particularly Holocaust survivors and their families and descendants and any students who are joining us. I also want to thank the community partners. My goal tonight in this talk is to look at the history of key women in Nazi occupied Europe, including in the ghettos and forests, those who fought with pistols and pens as educators, as rescuers, as partisans and in the underground. I propose that integrating this history of heroines, of women who resisted, can deepen our understanding of the Holocaust and how Jewish and non-Jewish communities responded. Among my goals over the past few years has been to identify a canon of heroines, a key group of heroines, alongside colleagues devoted to the history of women in the Holocaust working together to propose which women's names we should be able to identify as rescuers and resistors alongside names like Oscar Schindler or Raoul Wallenberg. This is an ongoing project and I welcome your thoughts. I'm just gonna pull up my slides. Why can we name the perpetrators and not the resistors? What is the place of resistance and rescue in Holocaust education? How come we don't look at the way in which women's leadership skills developed and how it fits into strategies for human rights? And this is at a moment when we know that many millennials don't, cannot name Auschwitz and that although Holocaust education is broadly supported, there's a movement in order to make it more engaging. Um, and I believe that we should listen to the words of Faye Shulman um, who said that she wanted people, I want people to know that there was resistance. I check photos and I have proof. Like Anne Frank's diary and the art of the children of Theresen, her photographs represent a form of resistance and defiance. For the state of Israel, when it declared Yom HaShoah V'Hagivurah, it, it called it a national day of commemoration and remembrance of both martyrs and heroes and selected the date of 27th of Nisan to tie the remembrance of the Holocaust to the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, in fact, resistance was widespread in ghettos, forced labor camps, and concentration camps. And in fact, historians will now argue in many aspects of daily life, a concept known as Amida or standing up. When I became interested in this topic four years ago, I went to visit the ghetto fighter's house um, to, to learn about Zivia Lubetkin, who I'll be speaking about in the second half of this talk, the leading woman in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. 
and I was able to both visit her grave and their archives and confirm that they have individual files on 3,000 Jewish women who fought in the resistance. In addition, we know that over 13,000 women have been honored by Yad Vashem as righteous Gentiles, women of all faiths and from many different countries. We have no shortage of role models. One of the leading female historians of the Holocaust, Judy Bomel Schwartz has written, women, heroism, and the Holocaust evokes a broad spectrum of associations from resistance fighters to self-sacrificing mothers, underground couriers to religious martyrs. And another historian of the Holocaust, Mark Ketko, who specializes in the role of Jews in the military in World War II, says, why when we think about Jews in the world in World War II, do we automatically think about the Holocaust and not their contribution to the victory over the Nazis? Jews fought and Jewish women fought and stormed the front lines with Nazi enemies with the intention of saving not only the remaining Jews, but all human beings, their liberties and their principles of democracies and enlightenment. She gives the example that over 100,000 women fought in the Soviet army during World War II, whether as doctors or paramedics. For example, Lieutenant Lydia Litvak of Moscow dropped over 100 tons of bombs with 142 definite hits. She shot down 12 enemy aircrafts until her death in August of 1943. Further, women have long been on the front lines of social justice movements, indeed its backbone, yet are often rendered invisible. A recent study by the Pew Research Center suggests that women excel at compromise and negotiation in situations where men might take risks and escalate tension. I argue we must make visible the central role of women and their contribution to building anti-fascist networks and direct confrontation with the Nazis. I intend to demonstrate that Zivi Lubetkin, Marianne Cohn, Friedel Dicker Brandeis, and others offer clear lessons in transformational leadership relevant to the school of the human spirit. I must pause and give um, due acknowledgement to the role of, of Holocaust survivors in Staten Island in inspiring me to undertake this research. It's in hearing the stories of their sisters, their mothers, and their own stories of courage, um, and in particular, the role of several of them in uprisings during the Holocaust that I became interested in this notion of resistance. Um, and in particular, I'll mention um, Shirley Gottesman, um, who was one of the eyewitnesses to the uprising in Auschwitz um, by Rosa Rabada and other um, women who worked alongside her and men and non-Jewish men to smuggle gunpowder and eventually blow up crematoria four which she was able to witness. Um, in addition, I've been working with different theater professors and you'll be able to see this tonight in some of the performances um, that I will play. Uh, this work is inspired by French resistance fighter, Charlotte Delbo, who is caught and sent to Auschwitz. She's not Jewish, um, but her play, Who Will Carry the Word, is one of the most profound writings of, by women about Auschwitz that I have ever read. I strongly recommend it. Inspired by this work, we created a series of plays capturing the stories of local Staten Island Holocaust survivors and weaving into them the notion, the, the examples of other elite women, um, other women, key women leaders in the resistance movements. Um, in addition, for the 25th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Elie Wiesel, perhaps inspired by his wife Marion's love of theater, um, or future wife Marion's, uh, wrote his first play, um, which was about a female resistance leader in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, and I also just want to mention Hannah Senesh, of all the women who resisted, she likely is the, the best known. Um, she was 23 years old um, when she served as a parachutist in the British Army. Um, her beautiful poetry um, has been preserved, but not everybody knows that in fact there were three women who parachuted with her, who were trained with her to eventually uh, invade other countries of Europe. Um, and of these, one perished in Slovakia in the Slovakian uprising, Haviva Reich, 
and um, Sarika Braveman survives. Um, and it's just interesting how many stories there are um, once you start looking into the different stories. So I'm gonna focus tonight on about five that I think are just required, um, just essential stories about um, women who had tremendous bravery and courage and contribute to our understanding of how the Holocaust unfolded. And I'm gonna start with Marion Cohn, um, both because she's a Jewish rescuer. So unlike um, the non-Jews who participated with her in this rescue operation for many years, she wasn't recognized, only um, her non-Jewish counterparts were. And eventually Yad Vashem built a garden in her honor. Um, and there's also two schools named after her. Like Hannah Sanis, she was a poet and we're gonna hear one of her poems in a moment. But let me take a minute to first tell you a little bit about her and the organization she was a part of. There were, two, there were more than a hundred Jewish rescue organizations in France and uh, Mordechai Poldiel, who has written the book, I strongly recommend Jews Who Rescued Jews um, after serving for 20 years as head of Yad Vashem's Righteous Gentile program. He beca became persuaded that Jews who rescued Jews also needed to be acknowledged the way righteous Gentiles are. Um, and that is his like new mission. Um, and he's been very successful. And I read his chapter on Marion Cohn and then I've read many other things about her. And she is truly an extraordinary young woman. Um, she rescued over 200 children as part of an organization, the Jewish Scouts that rescued 1800 children and young adults. Um, they had a, a network of farms um, throughout France and, and, a, and a group spirit, a Zionist spirit that served them well once the war broke out because they already had this common bond um, that was, you know, is part of the training for becoming an activist or human rights activist. Um, Marion herself was a refugee. She had been born in Germany, fled with her family to Barcelona and then settled in Paris. During the war years, her parents were incarcerated in Gur, which is the French camp on the border with Spain. And Marianne and her sister Lisette were sent by the Jewish scouts to safety. Um, and she became involved in organizing information on the identities of hidden Jewish children and locating possible hiding spots. The motto of the Jewish scouts was Simcha Avodah, joy and work. Um, at age 21, her underground work expanded when the scouts moved to Grenoble, not far from the border with Switzerland. Using the alias Marie Cohn, Colin, she would travel with groups of children from ages four to 16 by train, truck, and on foot, smuggling successive groups of Jewish children to safety across the French-Swiss border. She carefully timed her journey so she would avoid German soldiers in the train stations, crossing over bridges, and then she would walk from the, from the train station, she would take a truck close to the border and then walk with the children across the border and pull and the, the barbed wires. During one of her trips, she was caught by a German patrol on May 31st, 1944. Um, they were taken to a prison in Anmas where she refused offers to help her escape. Um, the mayor was able to rescue 17 of the children. 11 of them stayed with her in prison, the older children. And they would go and clean Nazi buildings, buildings that were occupied by German troops. Um, and during the travel, um, the Jewish scouts felt they would have been able to ambush the truck and rescue her, but not the, the other 11 children. And she was afraid that there would be some kind of reprisal for her escape. So she refused to leave. Um, one of the 10 year old girls who was saved by her described what it was like um, on the night that they were captured, how the German suddenly appeared with dogs and said, are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? We all found the courage to say no, Renee says. It made little difference, but we were and we were sent to prison. Every day, Marianne herself was taken away for questioning, returning each evening with a red and swollen face, having been subjected to hot and cold baths, um, amongst other forms of torture. Her face became more deformed as time went on. Marion never faltered. However, she was murdered by the Gestapo. 
But before she was murdered um, and taken from prison and um, she was actually killed outdoors, it took them a lot of um, weeks to find her body. Uh, she wrote the most beautiful poem um, and one of my students will read it to you. I will betray tomorrow, not today. Today, tear off my fingernails, I will not betray. You do not know the extent of my courage. I know. You are five rough hands, harsh and full of rings. You are wearing hobnailed boots. I will betray tomorrow, not today, tomorrow. I need the night to make up my mind. I need at least one night to deny, to abjure, to betray, to disown my friends, to abjure bread and wine, to betray life, to die. I will betray tomorrow. Not today. The file is under the window pane. The file is not meant for the executioner. The file is not meant for the torturer. The file is for my wrists. Today, I do not have anything to say. I will betray tomorrow. Um, and again, one of the most startling um, things of, when you begin to look into women and resistance is this is page is just a very few of the women who resisted who are so associated with the French resistance. Um, some of you may know some names. Andre Peel is credited with saving the lives of 100 Allied airmen. Um, Marie Madeleine Fourcade was head of the single largest French resistance network. The Germans called it Noah's Ark because all their code names were animals. Um, she was captured twice and each time escaped from prison. Um, some of you may know Josephine Baker um, in a much more lighthearted way, but when the war breaks out, Jacques Abbe, the head of French military intelligence approaches her um, and, and she, to ask her if she would agree to be part of the resistance. She says, France made me what I am. I will be grateful forever. The people of Paris have given me anything. I am ready captain to give them my life. You can use me as you wish. Um, and indeed as an entertainer, um, Josephine Baker had faced tremendous uh, racism both in the United States and when she performed in Vienna. Um, and she became incredibly sympathetic to um, the, the way in which the Nazis were treating the Jews and her third husband was also um, French and Jewish. Um, and so she became involved in um, collecting information. Um, and in particular, she was known for uh, using invisible ink on her sheet music in order to convey safe state secrets. Um, so she was, eventually given um, a, a title in the Women's Auxiliary um, and de Gaulle later gave her the Rosette de la Resistance. And this is the uh, uniform she wore when she spoke at the March on Washington, one of the very few women um, who spoke at that event. Um, Nancy Wake was from New Zealand, also involved with the SOE. And I know you're familiar with Noor Inyat Khan from the last talk and Germaine Tillon is the third woman ever to be interred in the French pantheon um, because of the fact that she was associated with the first, creating the first resistance cell in France. And the list goes on and on. So in terms of rescue of children, um, Marianne Cohn serves as our example of a Jewish rescu rescuer who had she been not Jewish would have been named as a righteous Gentile um, and finally was in fact recognized by Francois Mitterrand, the president of France in 1982 um, in creating a garden at Yad Vashem. 
Another category of exceptional women resistors are educators. And I'm just gonna use one example of Friedel Dicker Brandeis, who you may be familiar with through the work of the children in the Terrazin ghetto and particularly the butterfly art. Friedel Dicker Brandeis believed in the limitless potential of children like the educator Janusz Korczak and his colleague Stefania Wilzinska in Warsaw, Frida lived alongside her children and treasured and respected their voices. For two years, her classes enabled these Jewish children to develop their own forms of self-expression, cohorts of mutual aid and shared vision based on her own artistic relationships. As one of her students, Eva Dorian said, um, one of her surviving students, I believe she, what she wanted from us was not directly linked to drawing, but to the expression of feelings to liberate us from our fears. And indeed her art technique, her art techniques included breathing and meditation exercises, instilling empathy, courage, and resilience and are considered to be the foundations of the field of art history. For 20 months in Terrazin as director of Girls House 410, Friedel Dicker nurtured a spirit of defiance in over 600 children, the vast majority of them young women. Um, young girls fought back against the anonymity of mass extermination by proudly signing their names to singular images of Hanukkah menorahs, flower vases, soup distribution lines, deportations, and ambulances. By documenting their dreams and nightmares, these Jewish girls maintained their given names and individuality. Like diaries, their drawings are an act of heroism. However, that is not actually, I, I don't want to only remember her as an educator. I want to argue that her ability to teach this way um, was linked both to her modern art training, but also to her experience in the resistance. Um, before the Nazis even came to power, she was involved with um, using her art skills to falsify passports and documents to help communists escape from the Nazi roundups as soon as they came to power in 1933. Um, she was twice arrested um, by the Gestapo. She created two horrifying paintings of those encounters where you can see like her red ears, um, and they're these very moving paintings. She went on to portray herself as having courage that came out of this experience of interrogation. Um, and she also created uh, propaganda posters against the Nazis, such as this one where you had Hitler and Ernst Strom and a whole slew of Nazis alongside a floating baby. And she asked the question, if you do not like this world, or she makes the statement, if you do not like this world, then you will have to change it. So while we sometimes see the children's paintings in Terrazin as just a beautiful expression of humanity, actually it has everything to do with women's leadership skills um, and particularly the training and experiences and politicization of Friedel Dicker Brandeis. Um, one of her closest friends who was a non-Jewish German communist would visit her and they would have to walk one behind the other because it wasn't uh, allowed at that point in, in, in Prague to, to walk next to each other. And of all the paintings and um, to get at a little bit of how uh, these girls were heroines in their own right, um, I picked my favorite painting um, which also happens to be very admired by one of the great art historians, Simon Shama. Um, and Helena, like a quarter million Jewish children, like Friedel Dicker Brandeis, is sent to Auschwitz and exterminated. Um, but before she does so, she leaves behind this red canvas. Um, Friedel would have them make copies on great masters. And this is how Simon Shama describes her painting. The white paper used for stars and mountains is office stationary. It's heading inverted by Helena. So it lies at the foot of her composition. Check. The sheet is not some enumeration of transports each, one of which would carry Helena and 90% of the children of Teresa to her death, but simply dull bureaucratic paper of the kind needed by those who manage the efficient business of mass extermination. But for a moment, Helena had cleansed the sheet of its moral dirt. She had made art. And I just wanna point out 
that not only did she make the sky red, blood red, but her stars are Jewish stars in the sky. And it's just a very touching example of how Friedel Dicker Brandeis encouraged these girls to express themselves um, and their identity and to leave behind legacies, um, including Friedel Dicker herself left behind a legacy of 4,000 children's paintings. Um, and now I'm gonna turn to the question of armed resistance. Um, and I'm gonna start with Vitka Kempner because I wanna start where resistance to the final solution begins in Vilna. Um, and I wanna talk about how Vitka became conscious of the need to resist. Um, from the moment they entered her hometown, she was, she was uh, living in Poland right along the border with Germany. She could not tolerate the way, the humiliating way the Nazis treated the Jews. And so she fled to Vilna, the Jerusalem of Europe, which was then under Russian occupation. Um, but two years later, when the, when the, when the Nazis invade, um, invade Lithuania uh, and begin to kill the Jews at Ponary, and, and it becomes necessary to organize, and Ava Kovner, who is in her youth group, in the youth group with her, um, uh, Ava Kovner is noted, he's 24 years old um, and she's uh, 20, 19, I think at the very beginning. He's credited as being the first person to recognize Hitler conspires to kill all the Jews of Europe and the Jews of Lithuania have been picked at the front line. The first open call for Jewish armed resistance rise up until your last breath. And what's most extraordinary is that, um, she leaves the safety of the convent where she is um, located and returns for missions in the ghetto to try to help the Jews. And eventually when it's necessary, she'll be the one that escorts the Jews out of um, the ghetto. And um, as they organize, the, she's, she's very close with Ava Kovner and another young woman, Ruka Korchek. Um, and I just, since we're coming up on Passover, I just wanted to mention that that Passover, um, you can already sense in how they're celebrating the Seder, the, the, mo their motives, their, their passion to resist. Um, and Rucha says, you know, what is different? Why is this night different from other nights, right? We are different. If we fall, we shall fall fighting. Our blood will bring redemption. Um, and in fact, Vitka Kempner, um, is credited as being the first person to explode a bomb um, in the Vilna ghetto. Uh, she sneaks out multiple times to find the right spot. Um, she leaves the Vilna ghetto and it's the first time anyone in Lithuania attacks not a Nazi train, 200, 200 um, German soldiers are killed. Um, she's picked a location where it's not associated with the Jews in the ghetto, so there won't be any collective reprisal. And when, um, in 1961, Ava Kovner is called to testify in the Eichmann trial, he speaks at length of how, you know, proud the Jews were, that it wasn't a Russian or a Lithuanian, but a, a female Jew who, you know, blows up the first Nazi train. And she goes on many other missions and now I'm gonna play you a short video, um, which is both a tribute to her. Um, actually, I'm just gonna say a few words about the, the song you'll hear at the beginning of the video. Um, and then her words about another act of sabotage that she commits later in Vilna after she becomes a partisan. Um, at the beginning of the video I'm about to play, um, three of my students are singing a poem by Hirsch Glick. You may be familiar with this poem, The Female Partisan. Um, it begins, the quiet night is full of stars. It's a poem he writes specifically in tribute, um, in tribute to uh, Vitka Kempner's act of resistance in blowing up the train. Um, and uh, it's a very beautiful Yiddish song. Um, it's not as well known as the other partisan song. Um, but it's, it's very beautiful and I want you to hear it and think about what it means to, ha to have a song written for you, written for the 3000 women partisans 
Um, and yet today we don't really know this song, I think as well as we should. Um, so I'm gonna ask um, somebody at the Holocaust Center to pull up the video now. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, and ask you to play this five minute clip. I can't hear it. Whoops. We can't, I, I can't hear it. Can you stop it and see if you can reload it with the volume? Otherwise I can try to see, I, I can pull up my version of it if that doesn't work. It's over. in Vilna, so that the Germans would be afraid that the partisans had come, even to Vilna. And the aim was to have the girls explode the electric transformer, which gave the city life, and have the boys destroy the network of pipes underground, the essential water utilities in the sewers. So we came, the Rokhaya and me, and we had some bombs, magnetic bombs, and we connected them to the transformer. And that night, four transformers were exploded. 
With Germans walking through the streets, we hid in the shadows. We set the timers for four hours. We knew we had to flee Vilna, but the boys would not come. They were too tired. And sadly, we made it, and the boys did not, because they were tired. And we were tired too, but the women were stronger than the men. Thank you. Let me go back to screen sharing my slides. Um, yeah, and um, so this, I, I hope that some of you will continue to uh, look into this beautiful poem um, and song and also to seek to understand, uh, you know, Vitka Kempner and the role of women in the Lithuanian resistance and her tremendous accomplishments. And in Ava Kovner's testimony, he also speaks about other women um, who played important roles going from town to town to alert uh, the Jews about the, the massacres and about the need to either escape and resist through the partisan movement or fight back in the ghettos. Um, this is one more example of um, a very important resistance fighter, uh, Sarah Gnaita, um, and Rubinson, she marries while she's still in the ghetto before she goes into the partisans. And when she's only 17 years old um, is when the Nazis, the Einsatz group uh, come and begin the mass killings in Lithuania in October of 1941. And she determines to get involved in the resistance movement. Her three uncles were killed during this in the, the invasion of Lithuania. Um, she's in the Kovno ghetto. And she joins, um, first she in, first within the ghetto itself, um, she slowly begins to smuggle in weapons. At one point she's smuggling in a Japanese uh, uh, made gun uh, and she, the, one of the Jewish policemen on duty uh, is able to distract uh, the Germans and, and get her into the ghetto. She says, I'm carrying something that's not kosher and he knows exactly what she means and he helps her get into the ghetto. Um, and then when they determine that it's no longer safe to be in the ghetto, she's in the first group of fighters that goes out into the forest and joins a unit called Death to the Occupiers. Um, on one of their raids, one of the um, peasant women tries to tell her that war is not for women to fight. Um, and her reply is the killing of women and children proper work for men. Um, so she's credited with saving many people by helping them to get in and out of the ghetto, including some of the children. She, they they um, give them sleep, sleeping pills and then carry them out in, in uh, backpacks. Um, but one, one of the really extraordinary things she's associated with, other than that beautiful photo of her with the rifle, um, is the story of how she gets the rifle on International Women's Day, which was last Monday this year. Um, and she gives a truly remarkable speech um, both for what it tells us about how women lived on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a, it's a fairly long speech. Um, and I'm just gonna read this, this section of it, um, uh, that after women were 15% of the detachment, nobody taught us how to fight or to perform our duties. We learned by ourselves, not only how to clean and use a gun, but how to conduct ourselves in combat and battle, how to blow up a bridge or a train, how to cut communication lines and how to stand on guard. On the occasion of International Women's Day, many women in our detachment were honored. My happiest surprise was the receipt of a rifle from Costa, our commander. And then she goes on to say that she was so surprised that she kissed her rifle. Um, and she, she talks about how the women dressed and how that day some of the women dressed up with makeup and and fancy clothing and other women just wore trousers like her and how she had two belts, one for her pants and one for her pistol. Um, and it's, it's just, a, it's a very important speech because unlike the poem um, where Hirsch Glick talks about teaching Vitka how to shoot, um, in fact, many of the women in the partisans 
taught themselves medicine, taught themselves how to shoot. Um, they were very self-reliant in her words. Um, and finally, on the day of the liberation of um, the Vilna ghetto, she's there and a Soviet officer who happens to be Jewish sees her with her rifle. And that's how we have this photo of her um, standing on lookout duty um, as the Germans were being chased out of, um, out of Lithuania. And this is her book, Resistance and Survival. And finally, I'm gonna spend a few, just a few minutes talking about um, the woman who I believe is most worthy of commemoration, um, somebody who everyone should know her name, uh, the highest ranking woman of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, whose ideology was very much about shared responsibility, about community. And if you look at her experience in World War II, you see that starting in 1940, long before there's any idea about an uprising, she's already organizing young people in every way possible um, that, and, and expressing that what is enabling her to survive and, you know, and move forward is knowing that there's a community, a Zionist youth group, um, people who share her values and her ideals, and that it's the combination of all these young people's energy that's gonna make resistance possible. And so she trains not only in her own youth group, but as a, as a leader, she works in Hehalutz Hatzair, traveling all over Poland. You can see how this is gonna help her later on. Um, she's a representative in 1939 on the eve of the war at the Zionist Congress. After the, after, the, after the Congress ends with the outbreak of war, a group of women are appointed and she's on that committee in case the men get drafted. She plays a critical role in looking for escape routes to Eretz Yisrael. She's in Vilna in the Soviet territory, but her colleagues believe that they, they can't, they, she's too important to not have her in the German occupied city of Warsaw. And so another one of the couriers asks that she come back to Warsaw and there she negotiates with Polish employers, not unlike the Jewish scouts in France for that young Jewish uh, men and women can work on farms, which gets them out of the unhealthy atmosphere of the ghetto and enables them access to food. And she's also negotiating with the Judenrat and the JDC for funds for the youth organizations. And she's organizing high school classes and lectures. She's constantly organizing. And this puts her, um, how, has her developing the skills that she'll need once the news of Chelmno and Ponery come through, once Ava Kovner and Victor Kempner let the world know, you know, and, and the word gets out about the about Ponery, about the the Einsatzgruppen, um, and they begin to ask. She's on the front lines of organizing numerous um, or official organizations, starting in March of, of, of 1942, to try to create resistance to fascism. And as two weeks after the, the great summer deportations, um, the, the, the gross action, um, the deportation of 3000 Jews in Warsaw, she's on the organizing committee with her future husband, Yitzhak Zuckerman, um, with Mordechai Anielewicz, with another woman um, to, to create resistance in the Warsaw ghetto. Um, their first actions are putting up posters, warning um, you know, the Jews that they shouldn't be just getting onto the trains. And, um, and in this effort, she's um, vitally helped. Um, I won't read that all of her writings about these women are just exceptional. Um, for example, uh, Lanka, who is pictured here uh, on the right, she, she talks about how she speaks six languages and how she's able to carry all kinds of weapons and papers in suitcases and then um, just flirt with the right German soldier and they actually will carry the suitcases for her. Um, she just has astonishing stories of these women's heroism. Um, and in the January uprising or the January action, um, after the 300,000 Jews are are um, deported between July and October, and the, the underground movement becomes very active in the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, the next time the Germans come in in January, they're prepared. Um, and while the group with Mordechai Anielewicz confronts the German soldiers at the um, Umschlagplatz, at the deportation plaza, and every one of them 
um, is killed after, you know, they throw hand grenades, they, they attack the Germans, but Zivia's group waits inside. It's a guerrilla warfare tactic. The Germans come to them. And when the Germans are approaching them, that's when they attack. And, and with the particular weapon of light bulbs filled with sulfuric acid. Um, and their passion for fighting back against the Germans is ignited. Um, and the success of the January uprising um, is, is not so much that, that not all the Jews are deported, but much more importantly, when they see that a German, that the Jews are willing to fight back, the Polish underground is more willing to give weapons. Um, these are some of the weapons that you would see at the ghetto fighters house. Um, and they're able to prepare for the April uprising. And during the April uprising, she's directly involved in the military command structure. Um, Mordechai Anielewicz, uh needs her help because there's so many different factions, even with in the 500 fighters, um, that it's just critical to have a, a, a group leadership philosophy. Um, and um, the scholar Av Avihu Ronin has written about a dual leadership structure where often in Jewish resistance movements, there was a team like Yitzchak Zuckerman and Zivia, husband and wife or girlfriend and boyfriend in that case. Um, Sarah Ganaita's uh, husband was also in the resistance. Um, and in this very dramatic moment in her memoir at the very beginning of the April uprising, she describes uh, the Germans are approaching the building where again, they have adapted this guerrilla warfare of hiding inside the buildings. One of the women in the unit, she writes, the poor Alara leaned out of the window and hurled bottles of acid onto the Germans below. And the Germans responded, Ein Frau Kampf, a woman is fighting. And in fact, the Germans were um, astounded by, um, and, and Jürgen Stroop, who wrote, writes this report about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, the Germans are astounded by how many women and with how much ferocity and courage they fight throughout the four weeks of the Warsaw Uprising. And this is one of the photos of these three women, only the first one survives, um, women who were involved in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, also another very important um, colleague of Zivia, Tosia Altman, um, who's very um, active in bringing weapons into the ghetto um, and also in, in rescuing fighters who were trapped in the burning sections of Warsaw. She's able to escape when the Germans attack the headquarters at Mila 18, um, but unfortunately she dies on the Aryan side. Zivia escapes with a select group of um, fighters through the sewers. It's a very traumatic experience. They're in the sewers I think for 48 hours, she has her gun on her. And then at the last minute, uh, they get separated and half of the fighters are not rescued with her um, because they get lost in the sewers and she doesn't wanna leave. Um, and she whips out her gun and says to one of the other Jewish resistance fighters, we can't leave without all of our comrades, um, but there's no time. They have to bring the ones that came out to safety. Um, it's another one of the tragedies of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising that explains in part why, although these resistance fighters are so heroic, they don't necessarily see themselves that way. They only see themselves as heading towards the goal of one day reaching Eretz Yisrael, taking revenge um, and working together as part of a team to fight the Nazis. Um, and she goes on and fights in the 1944 Warsaw Uprising. Um, so I'm gonna try to wrap up so there's time for at least one or two questions. I think that that does it. Um, but just to say that having students read these testimonies to me is an important way to further the memory of the Shoah, to further, to, you, to, to inspire young people with the power of the courage of the resistance fighters. So hopefully that leaves a few seconds for Q&A. All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Weintraub. That was fascinating. And we do want to leave um, a few minutes for Q&A. So Robin asked, how did the children's artwork survive? One is shown in the Prague Jewish Museum and where else might it be? So 
Friedel's, uh, when she is deported from Prague to Terezin, instead of packing clothes, she packs paintbrushes and pencils and cloth so she can decorate the camp. Um, and when she goes, when she's deported from, she volunteers to be with her husband on a transport from Terezin to Auschwitz um, to follow her husband. And um, and when she leaves, she leaves the artwork, th th these 4,000 paintings, um, drawings and sketches and a few mobiles um, in the care of one of the other educators in Terrazin. And again, in Terrazin too, it's a sense of uh, there's teamwork. You know, it's not just one person by themselves. The, 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 the Jews are working together and sometimes with non-Jews to rescue Jews, to strengthen the morale of Jews, to explode crema the crematory in Auschwitz. There's a collaboration. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was very, very informative. Um, and there's one other question that um, some people wanted to know. I'm just looking for it because I lost it. Um, oh yes, um, do you happen to know where uh, a copy of Zivia's memoir can be obtained? Someone said it's on their Amazon watch list, but it never seems to show up. Yes, yeah, so I recommend um, reading Zivia's testimony at the Eichmann trial, which is very easy to access. And it's like a mini version of her memoir, but her memoir is phenomenal. Um, I scanned a copy and I upload it for my students to read every semester, but it's very hard to get a hold of other than that. But it's, it's I, I, I'm working to, with the Ghetto Fighters House to see if they might be interested to republish it. I definitely think um, it's it's very important to republish it. So there is a new, I know there's a new book coming out about the Warsaw Ghetto. Um, I'm not sure the title, but or the author, but I, if you keep an eye out, there is someone who has a chapter from her memoir, um, or you can email me and I can send you fragments of it perhaps, um, or get you in touch with the Ghetto Fighters House. The Ghetto Fighters House has such an important exhibit online um, as well as in person, if you have a chance to go. Um, it really made me persuaded that Yad Vashem is so important and, and irreplaceable, but you need a second stop in Israel. You need to go to Naharia and see the Ghetto Fighters House. Thank you, Dr. Weintraub, for such a fascinating discussion. And thank you again to our community partners, the National Council of Jewish Women Michigan and the University of Detroit Mercy Women's and Gender Studies Program. We invite you to watch our virtual Yom HaShoah commemoration on Thursday, April 8th at 7 p.m. Please visit www.holocaustcenter.org to share in the experience of Holocaust remembrance. The broadcast will include moving tributes from Holocaust survivors and local clergy, Rabbi Josh Bennett and Cantor Neil Michaels. Please consider taking part in the Worldwide Holocaust Memorial Project unto every person there is a name. You can help restore the identity and dignity of the victims of the Holocaust by recording yourself reciting their names. To sign up, visit holocaustcenter.org or call the HMC for more information. Thank you for joining us and good night. <laughs>